Uh, well, good morning, everybody. It is uh, great to see uh, so many people here this morning, and let me uh, offer a really warm welcome uh, to Great Victoria Street Baptist this morning. Uh, and let me also uh, continue to add our welcome to the people who are joining us online. Uh, it is great that you're able to be with us as well, even remotely. Well, this morning, as we meet, we come before a holy God, a God who is like no other. As we begin, uh, let's read these words from Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 to 8. And as I read those words, let's let these words sink in and remind us again who it is that we're coming to worship this morning. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what's to come and what will happen. Fear not nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. The God we come to this morning knows the beginning from the end, and he is in complete control of everything. And he's made us great promises that we can hold on to as well. And because of who he is, we know that he will bring those promises to completion. Well, let's pray as we come to this God now this morning. Heavenly Father, who is there like you? We come and bow before you this morning in worship and adoration because of who you are. All things are in your hand, including us this morning. And we rejoice that being in your hand is the safest, most comforting and strengthening place to be. Because you are a faithful and good God who loves to show mercy and compassion to your people. Please help us this morning to give you the praise, honour and glory that is rightly due to you. And help us to remember your goodness and your holiness. And that you are so far set apart from us because of your perfect and holy nature. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our, our, our opening two songs together now. Uh, and the first is uh, Holy, Holy, Holy. Which obviously picks up on this holiness of God. And the second song Jesus, strong and kind, reminds us that even though our God is so holy, there is someone we can run to, and that is our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand and sing uh, these songs as the music starts. <laughs> Oh, 
take a seat again. And it is really exciting this morning uh, to be officially able to welcome Paddy Hayes into membership here at the church. Uh, Paddy, as you come up uh, to join me here, uh, let me just uh, read out a quote that I love about church membership. It says this, Church membership is all about a church taking specific responsibility for you and you for a church. So, Paddy, as we officially welcome you into membership this morning, let us just say, as elders, deacons, and all of us here at the church family, we want to, we want to take on that responsibility of caring for you, mm. encouraging you, challenging you, and loving you uh, as a church family. And we are so thankful for the way that you have already shown all of those things to, to many of us as well up to this point. Um, and let me also just say, Paddy, it's been such a joy over these past months to see your passion for Christ. It's been so great and such a, a privilege to be uh, serving and working alongside you in his kingdom. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, now, just before we uh, do our official elbow bump of fellowship, I've asked Paddy if he would just be willing to share a minute or so. Uh, I know that some of us heard from you uh, a while ago at your baptism, about yeah. your journey to Christ. Um, but it would be great to hear again, maybe just a snapshot, your journey to Christ, what brought you here as well to Great Vic. So. Yeah. Um, normally by the time I testimony, I like to link it with Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. You see Ephesians 1 down to 3, you see the section of dead and sin, bondage. Then you see down, is it 5 down to 9, nine but God. So if there's two sections before I save, then my but God move, uh, moment. And then first 10 says, good works, um, made alive in Christ, walking in Christ. So I try and use those three things and be real quick. Um, save the 18, so two things that kind of summarize my life before I was brought up in a loving household. Mum was Roman Catholic, dad was prod. That shaped my understanding in the sense I was brought up very Roman Catholic, did first confession, first communion. It meant that I, this is not, I'm not saying this is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, but in my opinion, I seen a small God who didn't really care about sin um, who wasn't really loving either. It was very passive and kind of far off. You kind of came through the priests and you did your confession. And, you know, if you sinned, it wasn't that bad. And the main thing I want to highlight was it was just that you had to work. You just had to be a good person and you would kind of get right with God. You know, you don't end up heaven. Heaven goes to heaven, not really hell. Um, and then that kind of flows out into, like, my secondary school life. I just live for the world. I live for sin. Um, yeah, I think... Paul sums up, like, if you don't worship the Lord, you'll worship the things created. So all the good things he gives us, like football, friendship, family, whatever it is, we place them before God. And that's what I did. I worshiped things that would give you satisfaction, football, drugs, drink, whatever it was. That was my God instead of the true and one living God. Um, and so that brings me up to about 16, 17, and then my but God moment. So through his providential hand, I started going to portrait Um First time meeting true Christians who experientially knew the Lord, loved the Lord, and preached his word. That brought me to church service. Again, 18, I would not want anything to do with God. Like I was dead in sin. I was happy living my life, being the God of my life. And then I'm confronted with a holy God compared to what I grew up with as kind of God. It didn't really matter, but this God is like, no, no, I'm holy, I'm just, I'm loving, I'm steadfast, I'm slow to anger, but I will punish sin, either the sinner, so me, or on my son, Jesus. And that's the first time I heard the gospel. And I'm not going to lie, I was, really, like, I was frightened because I was, whoa, this is a holy God. But what really put the fear of God, like the, the fear of the Lord in my heart was the love of God to see that, that he sent his son to die for me and that if I come to him, I don't get like a partial salvation that I have to do a wee bit of things. I get full salvation. I get everything that I need and he promises to give it to me. Like it was amazing. So I just remember that was just kind of the but God, like but God, rich in mercy. You're saved by grace through faith, which is a, faith, which is a gift from God so that you do not boast. And, and so that's kind of my but God moment when I believe that, as we talk about, so Steve talks about in Mark's gospel, we have an inside out problem. And so that means that we need an inside out solution. So the inside out solution was God's word being preached and his spirit giving me a new heart and me giving me eyes to see and ears to hear. And therefore, because he gave me the gift of faith, I come to him and I find rest for my soul in him. 
And then that flows into the last session, kind of good works. What's that look like? I start to live for the Lord. I kind of think of like Romans 7 and Romans 8. So uh, Romans 7, because yes, it, Sam, I tasted the Lord and he was good. It was glorious. Though I started to notice I was a sinner. So therefore I started to fall and see my sin and be broken over it. So as Paul says, I do not what I want to do and what I do, I do not do. So I had that struggle, but then I get to Romans 8. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's kind of my journey. That's my daily life. The struggle of sinning and not living for Christ and then reminding myself of the gospel. Paddy, it's not about you. Jesus has did it all. He has promised in his word that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And that's kind of my story up to now. And how I came to be here. I knew Steve. I heard him preach a couple of times doctrine changed i guess what the deal breaker was i remember coming one service and here steve and he says you know i'm not about gimmicks i'm about the gospel and that's just the christian life the gospel is not just for unbelievers it's for the believers too and i need that week in week out and as steve says we preach the word we pray the word and um, we sing the word like i just need the word of god i just need christ every single morning and so that's kind of what i came to great break kind of overview <laughs> Paddy, thank you so much for that encouragement just hearing that this morning. That is amazing. So uh, let me officially welcome you into membership here. And why don't uh, I, we just all pray together for Paddy and for ourselves. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your hand in Paddy's life. Thank you so much for how, even though he was dead in sin, you brought him to yourself. Lord, thank you for opening his blind eyes, to see Christ and to see his love for him. Lord, thank you that that same offer is out there for all of us uh, this morning. Uh, please would you help us to see that more this morning. And Lord, as we welcome Paddy into membership here, uh, and as uh, we as a fellowship serve together, Lord, help us to be a great support, encouragement, uh, and challenge to Paddy where he needs it. And Lord, Help him as well to go on serving you amongst us faithfully um, and knowing that in you, you approve all that he does. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in bringing him here to us. And we thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, buddy. Well, uh, let's continue in prayer um, as we come before God and continue to, to worship him together. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, as Paddy's just said, we are so aware of many ways that we continue to fail to live as we ought to. We think of the people that we should have been there for, the people that we have hurt, or the people that we've failed to care for and support as we should. And we're so aware, Lord, of our regular selfish thoughts and words that put us above others that you've placed around us and even above you, our God and creator. We are truly sorry, Lord, and repent of all these things. Please forgive us and grant us again a fresh vision and desire to live wholeheartedly for you, remembering that all of your ways are good and you do what is best for us. Thank you so much for the gift of your son, for his death and resurrection that gives sure and certain hope for the future, even despite our sin. Thank you that for those trusting in him, that final and ultimate enemy for us all, death, no longer has victory. But instead, we have victory through your son. We thank you and praise you for that, Lord, again this morning. Lord God, we also come to you this morning pleading for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing threats and persecution because of their faith in you. Lord, we pray for them and thank you that just as for us, even death is no longer the end for them. Please hold them fast, Lord, in the knowledge that as your sons and daughters, you will hold them fast. And you will ultimately bring them through this suffering and hardship. 
And please, Lord, in whatever way this is possible, would you enable them to have the boldness to, even in the midst of unjust, harsh treatment, hold out the light and kindness and goodness of Jesus to those around them. Even, Lord, holding it out to people who oppress them so that they, in turn, would see the beauty and glory of your gospel for themselves. Lord, we continue to think particularly of Christians in Afghanistan and ask for your peace and protection of them. And we do ask that in your mighty power and in your plan, you would somehow open doors for your gospel to go out in that country, even as it now sits under Taliban rule. We know you are sovereign and above all things. Please work for your glory and the good of your church in that country. Lord, we also lift up our church and our city here to you. As we look out into the city centre and our surrounding neighbourhoods, we are aware of so much suffering and hardship. Whether that's children suffering neglect from family and friends. People with no place to call home. People who aren't sure where their next meal will come from. People who have been displaced and seeking refuge here. Please, Lord, work in this city to make it a place where justice, peace and hope is offered to all. And please give comfort and strength to all those suffering here to keep going for one more day, one more week. And please, Lord, we ask that you would help us as a church and each of us as individuals to see how we can be a part of that. Help and guide us all, Lord, to be those who are ready and quick to show love and compassion to those in need around us wherever that may be, may be, and in whatever way that may be. In a similar way, Lord, we continue to pray as well for those within our fellowship here who are going through really difficult times at the moment. We think of those who have lost loved ones, and we ask for your help for them as they continue to grieve and as they adapt to and press on in what can seem to be a completely different life to the one they had before. We think also of those members here who are unable to meet with us at Great Vic because of ill health. Lord, we thought last week about the blessing that it is to meet together. And we're aware that not having that chance can be so hard. So we do pray for opportunities for others within the congregation here to go to encourage those in these situations. And we continue to ask for your own comfort and daily provision for them. Remind them, Lord, often of the hope and strength that they can find in you. And Lord, we are so aware of so many others that we want to lift up to you as well. But we know that you love them more than we could ever imagine. Please, Lord, be with those that we know personally who need your help today. And Lord, we thank you that we can bring all of these prayers to you because of the mighty work of your Son. And in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to read from God's word now, uh, from Mark chapter 8, verse 27, right the way through to uh, chapter 9, verse 1, uh, which is uh, where, where Steve will be speaking from shortly as we pick back up Mark's gospel together. So please do grab a Bible if you've got one. Uh, And turn with me to Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. 
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And forfeit his soul. For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Well, we look forward to hearing more from Steve on that passage later. Uh, uh, But before we do that, we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing the song, How Firm a Foundation. And again, this points us to that firm foundation that we have in that word that we've just read. And also it reminds us again that we have someone to come to, Jesus. And in him, he will never, ever forsake us. So let's stand and sing again as the music starts.
Please do take a seat again. And it's time now for the children to head out to their groups. Thanks very much for being with us up to this point. And we hope and pray that you will have loads of fun in your groups and be encouraged and strengthened as you hear from God's word there too. And as they make their way out, uh, let me just take this moment also to flag up a few things uh, for you uh, in coming up in the life of the church. First of all, just a reminder that we are restarting services in the evenings tonight. So uh, if you are free and able to, please do join us at 7 o'clock tonight, where we'll be beginning a series that comes, runs over the next few months in 1 Peter. Uh, and then also just to say, if you weren't with us on Wednesday evening for our consultative kind of vision evening that we had then, um, one of the things that we did there was hand out a short form for those of you who are regular with us to uh, fill in to give us a bit of an idea of areas that you would love to or are able to serve the church. Uh, and also just to hear back from you uh, a little bit about uh, ways that you would love to see the church continue to progress over the next few years. So if you weren't there or if you were there but didn't manage to fill in one of those forms, there are some more at the back um, in a little box there. So do grab one of those, fill them in. Uh, they will be really helpful for us as we map out a way forward for the church um, as well. Uh, and just two final things for your diary. Prayer meeting, uh, as usual, here at the church at 7.45. Uh, Steve will be speaking for us uh, then. And then also, uh, a date for your diary, the missionary weekend uh, is coming up. On Saturday the 9th, there'll be an evening uh, time together. And then on Sunday the 10th, both of those services will have that missionary focus. So uh, if you're able to keep that weekend free, I know that it is uh, such an encouragement and blessing uh, to us as we do that. Well, that's just about it from, from me, but just as we prepare to hear from God's word together, and as Steve comes to preach for us, let's pray and commit this time to him. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that it holds. Thank you that it is living and active. Lord, would you please plant your word deep in us this morning. Help us as we hear from Steve, from your word, to be ready to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And help Steve as he brings your word to us to be faithful and clear and bold in preaching and proclaiming what we need to hear this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Sam. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be together. And if you have your Bible, please do open with me to Mark chapter 8. Uh, we're picking up again this series in Mark's Gospel. At the end of June, we hit pause on this series, and so the first move I'm going to make this morning is uh, a little bit of recap so that we can remember what we've seen so far. We've called this series, Seeing Jesus to be Shaped by Jesus, because I believe that title really captures what Mark is doing in writing this gospel. Mark has written this biographical account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to help us see who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, what it means to have our whole lives shaped by him. You'll remember in Mark 1.1, Mark opens the gospel in this way, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what follows after that heading over the whole gospel is account after account of Jesus' life and ministry so that we can see that Jesus really is who Mark says he is. Jesus is not just a wise teacher. He's not just a moral exemplar, but he is the Christ, the Son of God. He is divine. He is God. So in the first half of the gospel, we've seen an emphasis on the actions of Jesus that point towards his divine authority. Remember when he started teaching in the temple there in chapter 1, the first thing the people said in amazement was, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. We saw that 
authority demonstrated then in chapters 2 and 3 when Jesus demonstrated dominion over unclean spirits. You'll remember also that account later on where he healed that man who had a legion of demons. No one could control him. No one could subdue him. And Jesus, with a word, restored that man to his right mind. We saw the authority of Jesus demonstrated in his dominion over the natural world. Do you remember how he stilled the storm, how he walked over the waves? We saw his dominion over sickness in the many healings, like the healing of the deaf and mute man or the woman with the issue of blood. We saw Jesus' dominion over sin when he forgave the sins of the paralyzed man. Remember he said, your sins are forgiven. And everyone drew breath and thought, who can forgive sins but God alone? And we saw Jesus' dominion and authority over death when he raised Jairus' daughter. So his authority has clearly been on display in the first half of this chapter. But remember, this is seeing Jesus to be shaped by Jesus. This gospel isn't just the story of Jesus in a vacuum. It's the story of Jesus and his disciples. They're called to be with him, to share in his ministry. But we've seen already so far in the first half of this gospel that they are slow to learn. They keep making mistakes. They find it difficult to trust Jesus. One moment they're doing well, the next they're struggling. And this is so helpful because as we trace the life of the disciples through this gospel, we see so much of our own struggles and our own struggle to believe and trust God with all the things that come our way. We can be slow to learn, slow to trust. We make mistakes. And we saw the first half ended with Jesus asking his distressed disciples, do you not yet understand? If I am in the boat with you, if I'm in the boat of your life, you can trust me. I will care for you. Along the way, we've acknowledged that this is a very well-organized gospel. That's something else we've seen as we've been looking through it. I pointed out last term that there are eight chapters on one side of this gospel, Jesus' life and ministry in and around Galilee. Then you get eight chapters on the other side, chapters 9 to 16, Jesus on his way to Jerusalem and to the cross. And then in the middle of the book, the spine, you get this passage that was read for us this morning, 8, 22 to 9, 1, and you get the key question at the center of it all where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And we closed off there last time saying this really is the key question of Mark's gospel. When you see the actions of Jesus that speak of his divine authority, when you see his his power and his grace and his kindness and his love, who do you conclude he is? And that's right at the middle of the gospel. Last time, we got halfway through the spine of uh, this gospel. And let me just recap where we were, because we're going to pick up kind of in the second half of that this morning. Remember there in chapter 8, verse 22, we saw the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. It's really important that we remember this because it is so important to get what's going on in the second half of the gospel. Jesus healed this man in two stages. The only healing that is done in this way in uh, the gospels. And I said last time that this healing of the blind man in two stages was like an enacted parable of where the disciples are at at this point in the gospel, in their understanding of Jesus. The first eight chapters have been like the first touch. When the disciples were asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered and said, you're the Christ. So they were seeing something. They were saying, you're, you're, you're more than a man. You are the Son of God. You have been sent by God into the world to save us. So see, they, they were seeing something, like the blind man with the first touch. He could see something, but he couldn't see clearly. They don't see clearly yet what kind of Christ Jesus is. They say, you're the Christ, but they don't really know what kind of Christ Jesus is. The kind that dies to save people from their sins. 
And when Jesus shared there uh, over in chapter 8, verses 31 to 33, that he was going to die, Peter rebuked him and said, no way, the Messiah doesn't lose. He doesn't die. And Jesus had to rebuke him sharply. So, Jesus, so Peter was saying, you're the Christ, but he doesn't yet see what it means that Jesus is the Christ. And so from verse 34 onwards, the rest of this gospel is more like the second touch of the blind man. Because the first touch, the blind man could see something, but he couldn't see clearly. But the second touch, he could see clearly. The whole of the second half of this gospel is Jesus helping his disciples and all of us listening in, helping us to understand what kind of Christ he is and how his journey to the cross shapes our whole lives of discipleship. So verses 34 to 38 are where we're picking up this morning. And in some ways, verse 34 is like a new heading over the second part of this gospel. In chapter 1, verse 1, we heard the first heading over this gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But now here, in chapter 8, verse 34, we have this new heading which we could frame as this, the beginning of discipleship, taking up our cross and following Jesus. And here begins the second half of the gospel. Jesus is saying in verses 34 to 38, just as my mission involves a journey through self-denial and giving up my life to bring the life and power of the kingdom, so yours following me will be a journey through self-denial to experience the life and power of the kingdom. In these verses where we're picking up this morning, Jesus tells us very clearly at the beginning of the second half of the gospel, Jesus tells us very clearly what true Christianity really is. That's what these verses are about. That's what they're here in the Bible to do. In fact, it is no overstatement to say that these verses, 34 to 38 of chapter 8, are the most important verses on what it means to be a true Christian in the whole of the Gospels. We need the clarity Jesus brings here. Because you know, like I know, the term Christian has become very broad today, where it is almost devoid of any significant meaning. Christian, I'm a Christian. That can mean, as you know, pretty much anything. People who simply say, I believe in God. That's all it takes. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Jehovah's Witnesses lay claim to the term Christian. Mormons lay claim to the term Christian. People who were baptized as babies or confirmed may say, well, because of that, I'm a Christian. There are even people today who don't believe in God who call themselves Christians, Christian atheists. Get your head around that. So this morning in these verses, we're going to hear Jesus giving us the what, the why, and the how of true Christianity. Jesus asks essentially a what question, or answers a what question, a why question, and a how question. And so the title of this message is simply this, the what, the why, and the how of true Christianity. Let's hear how Jesus answers this first question in verse 34. What does it really mean to follow Jesus? It's the most important question you can ever hear and answer. Verse 34 and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
The first thing to see here is that this calling is not for a select group of disciples. It's not for super spiritual Christians in a category of their own. Anyone who wants to claim the name follower of Christ, Christ's one, Christian, if anyone wants to claim that name, you must do what Jesus is saying here. Look at what it says in verse 34. He calls the crowd to him. I remember it when I used to attend Whitewell and get the bus up from Armagh. The pastor there, who's now gone home to the Lord, Jim McConnell, would have these moments and he'd step to the side and he'd say, right, come a bit closer to me. And you knew you couldn't come much closer to him, but what he was saying was, I need you to really listen because this is really important. Essentially, when Jesus calls the crowd to him, he's saying, okay, everyone, you need to gather in here. He calls the crowd to him with his disciples and says, if anyone would come after me. So this is exclusive. If anyone wants to be a Christ follower, this is what you must do. If anyone would come after me. Then Jesus summarizes in three statements what it means to be a true disciple. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now what does Jesus mean with these three statements. What does it mean to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him? I heard an interview recently from a member of the Scottish Nationalist Party where one of their members said in a great Scottish voice, Scotland should govern Scotland. And I thought, yeah, that explains what Jesus is getting at in some way here indirectly. Every one of us, without exception, by nature, we all want to be individually self-governing. I should govern me. We could call this the age of the sovereign self. Captured so well in Henley's poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. There's a throne at the center of each of our lives, and by nature, Every one of us, we want to be firmly seated on it, and we want to reign. Nothing today can overthrow the sovereignty of the self, even when it bumps up against reality. So, for example, if I, a man, want to say, I'm a woman, you must all bow to the sovereignty of the self. Reality must be redefined, not myself not my sovereign decree. By nature, I want to do things my way. It's in us all. We want ourselves to decide how we use our money. We want to be able to go out with whoever we want. We want to make up our own moral guidelines for our lives. We want to decide where we live or the standard of our lives. We want to decide how we use our time. We want to decide what we will buy. We want to watch whatever we want to watch on TV. We want to hold the reins of our lives firmly in our hands. I, 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 me, me, me. That's the way by nature every one of us wants to live. And Jesus here says in three statements, the Christian life begins with the death of the sovereign self. His call is the death knell over the sovereignty of the self. To deny self and take up your cross means you die to self-sovereignty, and you see that old self that wants to reign crucified with Jesus on the cross. Paul captures it so well in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It is Christ who lives in me. True Christianity, according to Jesus, starts here. No longer I, but Christ. I must become less the old man who wants to sovereignly rule over my life must step down, must be crucified, and the new man must step forward. That's the battle of the Christian life. 
Or, as Paul put it elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 5.15, Jesus died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for their sake and was raised. I love the clarity of the Bible. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, commenting on this, writes, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. The cross meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Death in Jesus, the death of the old self at his call. Have you come to Christ and died? Are you daily putting to death that old sovereign self who wants to rear his or her head again and exercise dominion? Isn't it so hard? You can be living your Christian life for years and years, and then there's something you really want, and you, you just wonder, is this pleasing to God? Is it honoring to God? Or I really want to do this, and I don't really want God to you know, be part of it. And, and the, the, the sovereignty of the self says, God, I want you to take the back seat, and I want to get in the front again. I want to reign again. It's the battle of Christian living. Let's be clear, becoming a Christian is the recognition that self-sovereignty is a form of rebellion against God. In fact, this was the essence of the first sin in Eden. Do you remember how Satan said to Adam and Eve when they said, we can't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden? Satan said, who says? God said, you'll die, you will not die, you'll be like God. You will be sovereign. You will reign. You'll know the difference between good and evil. You won't have to be subservient. You can be like God. And so they rebelled against God's sovereignty over their lives, and they chose self-sovereignty. And what was the result? It racked them with insecurity because human beings cannot bear the weight of sovereign responsibility for our lives. It racks us with insecurity. Our knees give out. Becoming a Christian is experiencing conviction of this sin. It's repenting. It's saying, no longer I, but Christ. Anything less than this is not true conversion. Let's just get this straight. Oh, beware the cross of the hypocrite. What do I mean by that phrase? Some people come to the cross today and say, God wouldn't want heaven without me. So he came down. He lost me and he wants me back because I'm so important to him. Jesus died to get me to heaven safely. It's very close to being a balanced truth, but it's an imbalanced truth. What people do when they do that is they often make the cross something that amplifies the centrality of the self. I'm so important to God. He wouldn't want heaven without me. And we make the gospel a man-centered thing that keeps self on the throne. And people who do this, they lay claim to Jesus, treat the cross like a golden ticket dispenser that gets them out of hell and into heaven, and they say, I'm a Christian. And they make some minor adjustments to their lives. They come to church. They give money. They maybe even sign up to serve. But here's the problem. The self has never been taken off the throne. And they're deceived. The self is still Lord. There has not been the crushing death blow to self that true Christianity demands. Christ is still on the sidelines person is still in the driving seat, and they're living under the illusion that they're a Christian. 
The true Christian life begins with a death blow to the self, the sovereign self. The Christian life continues with the battle to keep the old self under the authority of Jesus Christ as Lord. Or to put down the old self and see the new self live under the authority of Jesus as Lord. And essentially, you know, I was thinking at this point, how do you apply all of this? And I realized this is not really an application of go out and do this. It's, it's simply a mindset. It's simply conversion. <laughs> it, it, have you come to create Christ and died? Have you got it? Have you realized to be a Christian, is that, that all that I want to govern, I want to do it my way, that all dies and you say, no longer I, but Christ. What he says I want to do, where he goes I want to go. If he leads me here, I want to follow. It's no longer I who holds the reins, they're in Christ's hands. I put my whole life in Christ's hands. You know, that's not super spirituality, that's just, that's Christianity. Not according to me, according to Jesus. If anyone would come after me, you must deny yourself. You die, you take up your cross with Jesus, and you follow him, no matter what. That is the what of true Christianity. But in verses 35 to 37, Jesus now answers the second question. Why must this death happen? Jesus explains in verse 35, if you choose to save or preserve or hold back or hold on to the reins of your life, you'll lose your life. But if you lose your life, if you hand over the reins, if you die to self for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, you'll save your life. You'll be saved. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says, if you save or preserve your life, you'll lose it? If you hold it back and say, no, I want it myself, you'll lose it. What does Jesus mean? It's really important we get this clear. Over in the next chapter, in chapter 10, not 9, but 10, the chapter after that, Jesus is going to make clear what he ultimately means. Sorry, it is right at the end of chapter 9, 9 verses 42 to 50. Jesus speaks of the work of putting the old self to death to make sure you don't end up in hell. Jesus says it's better to cut off your hand if that causes you to sin rather than have two hands and go into hell. Jesus is teaching, and we're going to unpack this when we get to this passage in 42 to 50, that it's essential that we lose the old self that causes us to sin, the sovereignty of self, so that we don't lose our whole lives in hell. Jesus taught about the reality of hell more than anyone else, but he doesn't preach it to scare people into heaven. That's a way to reduce the cross to fire insurance policy. You'll notice Jesus does not do that. He preaches hell to show the awful reality of how awful sin is. That this is the only thing that can justly deal with the seriousness of our offenses with God, against God. And he also preaches hell to help us grasp the awesome reality of what he bore for us on the cross to save us. You read through the Gospels again, you'll notice that. Jesus says, here's why you must deny self, take up your cross, and follow me. If I'm your Lord, and you're under my care, I will save you from hell. Now, I, I, you know, people say, we don't want to hear that. You can't preach that anymore. Jesus preached this. It's good news. You've got to understand the reality of what's at stake here. We're not just here for good times and singing songs on a Sunday morning. We're here to deal with heaven and hell reality. Jesus said, if I'm your Lord, if you're under my care, I can save you from hell. You don't have to fear it. It cannot touch you if your life is in my hands. But if you reject me as your Lord, you will lose everything in that day and you will regret it forever. Perhaps one of the most awful things about hell will be the continual regret. People who heard messages like this and say, why, oh why did I not listen? Why do we sometimes hold back our lives 
Why do we keep them back? Well, we think self-sovereignty is the way to self-actualization. Satisfaction. This is where I'll get real life and happiness. I'll do it my way. I don't want anyone telling me what I can and can't do. I have a sovereign self. That's the way I'm free. But that is a lie from Satan. Self-sovereignty only leads to awful self-insecurity. And so if people are thinking of holding back the self, well, verses 36 and 37 are Jesus trying to convince us on why we must be willing to die to self. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Jesus is saying, right, let's imagine this. Imagine someone comes to you and says, look, I'm going to give you all you ever wished for in this world. Total financial security, a comfortable life, the dream relationship, respect and admiration from everyone around you. I give you everything. Relational harmony with everyone. I'll give you whatever you want, but in exchange, you must give up your soul to be lost. Jesus says that would be a bad deal. Why? Because Jesus knows this life is not all there is. This life is temporary. There is a hell to be avoided and a heaven to be gained. And the eternal life is eternal. To lose your soul to Satan and to hell eternally forever for the sake of a few measly years of self-sovereignty is a catastrophic error of judgment. In verse 37, Jesus says essentially that the soul, the essence of personhood, is eternal and of infinite worth. Nothing you can give can can cover the price, the pricelessness of your soul, the essential nature of your personhood. Jesus says, you hand your soul over to me, though, and I can cover the worth of your soul. Those who hand their souls, the essence of their person, into my hands, I will never lose them. John 6, 39, Jesus said, I'll lose none of those the Father has given me, but will raise them up on the last day. Your life will be safe. Your soul will be safe in his hands because he never drops a catch. He never lets a soul, a person, slip out of his hands. He said, I'll lose none of those the Father has given me, but I'll raise them up on the last day. That is such a wonderful hope, isn't it, for any of those we love who've gone ahead of us to be with the Lord already. Jesus holds them in his hand. He'll not lose them. He'll raise them up on the last day. The best is yet to come. So let me ask you again before we move on to the third question. Have you put your soul, your life into his hands? Have you given your soul to him for safekeeping? Do you know that on that day when you die and when you go to stand before the Lord in judgment, do you know you'll be safe because you've placed your hope in Jesus alone to save you? Jesus says, you hold it back, you lose it forever. But you give that life to me and you'll save it forever. And so my hero, Jim Elliott, one of them, has said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So that's the what. What is following Jesus really all about? Death to the sovereign self. Not I, but Christ. Why do we have to do it? Because there's a hell to be avoided and a heaven to be gained. Now, thirdly and finally, how does this life, this is the how question, how does this life of following Jesus find expression in our daily lives? And that's what we get in verse 38. Jesus makes clear here that this life of self-denial and following him finds expression in unashamed living for Jesus in this adulterous and sinful generation. We own his name. We own his commands. We live as salt and light for him. We march to the beat of Jesus' drum, not to the beat of our cultures and to everyone else's. We follow Jesus, even if it means ridicule, persecution, and even death. 
The message of verse 38 is crystal clear. If we are ashamed of Jesus, if we prefer our comfort, praise of others, fitting in, just going with the world rather than living for Jesus and in line with his commands, if we do not own his name in this generation, he will not own ours in the next. I find this deeply searching and challenging. Even more so because of a story I heard two weeks ago at Bangor Worldwide. I sat in the meeting and heard a lady called Rita, who's the CEO of a group called Sat7. Sat7 is a ministry that broadcasts Christian gospel content into millions and millions of Muslims' homes across the Middle East. Her name was Rita El Munier. She shared this story. She said, there's a church in Algeria who wrote to us. And they said, we have seen your broadcasts and we are encouraged. But we would like you to come and fill them our church. And so Rita felt, of course, I need to go and check this out. I need to go to Algeria uh, and I need to see what's happening. So she went to visit the church and she witnessed God's power at work. It's amazing. It's not a story you'll hear much about, but the church in Algeria growing under great oppression. And she said, so I went to see them and we realized the, the, the power of God, the, minute, the, the power of God's spirit was at work in this church and they were experiencing growth and a sense of courage in their culture that was incredible. And so Rita and the team at Sat7 decided we want to record and broadcast these services. And so they set up the camera and they, the pastor felt he needed to speak to his congregation before they all started. And he said to his congregation, look, for those of you in the front rows, you need to know your faces are going to be seen. People will know you're a Muslim convert to Jesus, and so you may want to move to the back if it would make you feel uncomfortable. Well, the first Sunday where the Sat7 team started recording, all the people wanted to move from the back to the front. And the lady from Sat7, Rita, said to some of those in the Algerian church, are you not afraid? And they said, Rita, afraid? Are you afraid? And she said, no, I'm not afraid. I'm afraid for you. And these Algerian church members said to her this, Rita, persecution is our crying. Do not take it away from us. We love Jesus, and he is worthy. And I just sat back, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I so often think we in the West are the strong church and the Middle East is the fragile and struggling church. It just dawned on me in that moment, they seem to be the strong church and we are the weak ones. It's how you define strength. I must be honest, it broke me. I've just asked, been asking myself, what am I doing? She shared with me another story at a breakfast this week of men in a similar persecuted area who chose to change their religion identity marker and their identity cards from Muslim to Christian. Knowing it could mean certain death, they said, but we want our children to know that we are willing to stand for Jesus. Today in Northern Ireland, true Christianity is not popular. To stand for the exclusivity of Jesus and his words on issues like abortion, sexual ethics, and the redefinition of marriage, it's not popular. We're no longer respectable as Christians. We are seen as a threat. A threat to secularism and a threat to progress. And many people would say that we are stupid for believing the things we believe. I have heard even in this last week of some NHS workers being put in very awkward positions over abortions. We're going to have to start to take our stand. Even if it means losing our job. Even if it means Stephen Nolan ridiculing us. 
we're going to have to take our stand. And the question that we have to ask in light of this last verse is, when that day comes, will you be ashamed of Jesus? For too long, I think we've been working out how to connect with our culture, and we haven't been preparing for the hard work of living as a minority in our culture. A minority that is viewed with great suspicion. I shared a few months back the story of watching that movie, We Bought a Zoo. The man who spoke to his son, who wanted to pluck up the courage to speak to a girl that he wanted to ask out. And his dad said to him, remember son, just 20 seconds of courage, that's all it takes. And back then I applied that to our evangelism and our stand for Jesus. And you think about it, 20 seconds of courage, it's all it takes. When you're ridiculed, when you're marginalized, when you lose your job as a teacher or an NHS worker or in whatever capacity you work in across the board, you can rejoice and be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Did we really think that the kingdom would mean merely a few minor adjustments to our lives? We need to rediscover true Christianity, Book of Acts Christianity in our generation. Doesn't it blow your mind that when the disciples were flogged, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy of suffering for the name. Does it not blow your mind that our, our brothers and sisters in Algeria are saying persecutions are crying? We love him and he's worthy. And here we are, afraid to even look a wee bit strange in front of people to speak for Jesus. We're afraid of what people will think. We have to, I think, rediscover the fact that it's normal <laughs> for Christians to take their stand and be persecuted and thought, 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 to be, uh, thought wrong of or whatever way you want to put that. For you and your work to feel awkward at times, for you to feel deeply uncomfortable in your culture, for people to be viewing us and hearing us, now, we don't go out as loudmouths trying to be hated or anything like that. With gentleness and respect, we stand for Christ, but we have to rediscover what it means to take up the cross, to follow the crucified Savior. True Christianity is what we must rediscover in our generation. We need to get back to saying, not I, but Christ. Salt and light, gentleness and respect, humility and courage. And we must remember that we follow the crucified Christ, yes, but also the conquering Christ. Because don't miss that note at the end of verse 38. There's a day coming when Jesus will return in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. And then in that strange verse in chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus speaks of some of them not tasting death until they see the power of the kingdom come. And that sets us up perfectly for next week and the transfiguration, the glimpse of the glory. And so let me ask you again in closing, have you come to Christ and died? Or for you, is it just respectable social Christianity? A few wee minor adjustments here and there. Self's on the throne. Jesus is to the side. And, uh, and that's what it is to me. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Progressive sanctification is a reality. You die, and then for the rest of your life, as Paddy explained, it's that battle to see the old self put down, crucified with Christ, go away, old self. I want the new self to step forward. I want to live out of my new identity in Christ. Not I, but Christ. I want to live the not I, but Christ life in my work, with my family, with my friends. And so your application, your primary response is that you will come away and say, it's not about what everyone else sees. I just want to follow Jesus where he lives. I want to deny myself. I want to take up my cross and say, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. It may mean suffering in very 
tangible ways or maybe in more subtle ways. But we follow Christ where he leads and we find the life that is truly life. Have you come to Christ and died? That is the place where you will find life. Let's pray. Father, this is deeply searching. It's been my prayer this morning that if there are any among us who are in any way self-deceived, it's my prayer that you would penetrate through that this morning and blow, uh, deal that death, death blow to, to the sovereign self. Here's where true discipleship begins. Have you come to Christ and died? Oh Lord, that is our place where we find life. Teach us by your Spirit how to respond to this message this morning. And as we sing now, yet not I, but Christ, and as we respond mm. the beginning of this new month around the Lord's table, help us to remember how united to Jesus that old self dies and the new living for Christ self is born. O oh Lord, bless us as we respond now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Stephen and Anna and the team are going to lead us just in uh, responding by standing to sing the first part of Yet Not I, But Christ. And then after that, I invite you to sit down and get your bread and your cup ready if you're sharing in the Lord's Supper. And we'll break bread and drink the cup together. Let's stand and respond. Bye. 